Welcome to Tommy Solo's Famous Friends. This is where I get to chat with people who I've connected with over the years in the world of arts and entertainment. And today I'm making a brand new connection with guitarist extraordinaire Uli John Roth. Welcome to the show, Uli. Hey, thanks for having me, Tommy. It is my absolute pleasure. It's been a bit of a go for us to make this happen today. So uh, I'm just glad that, that we are connected. And uh, from what I understand, yeah. you are parked in the tour bus on your way to Texas. <laughs> yes, uh, that's a long route. We actually, that's the only time on the tour. We have three days of travel and we're on the bus. You know, I guess I could have taken the plane, but I'm uh, toughing it out with everybody else. And <laughs> so far, it's fine. And um I'm always working anyways. I've got my computer. I've got so many things to do, you know, so I don't even notice the difference. We do have day rooms. So the the, um, the driver is sleeping now, and then we're driving in the night. And uh, so he's sleeping, and we have rooms for showering and whatever, you know. But, yeah, we're in the parking lot in Springfield, Missouri. Um and, so, and that's it. And tomorrow we'll probably be in Oklahoma or something, and then finally in Texas. So, I, from what I understand, you have uh, is it four more shows in Texas, and then you're off to yeah. Europe, and I believe We're you're going to be in Ireland. Um, yeah, I know. First, uh, we have one gig in a city called Ulm, U L M, in um, in the center of Germany, which is pretty much the only time when we're doing the same kind of show that we're doing in, in uh, Northern America, you know, where we're doing our uh, two programs uh, in one evening. So we're doing that on the uh, 25th. Then, um, yeah, I have to travel all the way to um, Ireland. We're playing the Rory Gallagher Festival in Ballyshannon the far end of Ireland, just at the other end. <clears throat> Quite difficult to get to because I remember it's a lot of driving, you know. And, I know a lot of people um, don't realize just yeah. how far North Ireland is as well. So um, yes. it's a totally Ireland different landscape. Right. Yeah, and when you fly into Ireland, you always fly to just Dublin, which is at the very beginning at the um, on the East Coast. And then the rest is driving, you know. Um, and you're I, driving I, through a lot of unpopulated areas. It's quite beautiful. Yeah, that's the part of the road that I enjoy the most is is when you get to a, a really scenic panorama, uh, you know, landscape. Uh, yeah, I understand that, that uh, this time around you're you're including uh, a master class on guitar within your shows. Yeah, no, we're not always doing it. We're doing it uh, sometimes. Uh, that's before the show, you know. So, um, yeah, that, that was a late add-on for uh, special VIP people. You know? So, as I said, it's not always happening. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you, I'd, I'd love to be a part of that because uh, mm -hmm. I, uh, I learned how to play guitar uh, all those years ago by, by ear. And, you know, we're taking the needle and putting it back and forth and ruining all That's of our records. I trying to... <laughs> yeah, those yeah. days are gone, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if only we had YouTube when we were young, man, life would Actually, be different. Actually, no, 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 no. I'm no? very happy I didn't have YouTube because YouTube presents you with too many shortcuts, shortcuts to heaven. Uh, I'm glad I had to do it with, quote unquote, the hard way, discovering the guitar really very much with my own senses and my own imagination it uh, gave me a head start in doing something original. You know, um, on YouTube, of course, it's easier to learn an instrument nowadays because, hey, you want to play this arpeggio? There are 10 guys showing you how to do it, you know? And so you don't have to solve any riddles. You don't have to, um, uh, you know, finish any puzzles. It's all there. Um, the one thing that's not there is... Um, well, it it, re it really leaves no room for your own imagination, you know. Um, it's you, you're just uh, following pre made recipes, which will, uh, of course, uh, if you follow them, turn you or may turn you into a competent guitar player, 
you know, but um, to become like an artist, you know, you, you need to think differently. So I don't think uh, I would have benefited much from YouTube. Maybe I would have played better, you know, but it, that, to me, that's not so important, actually. You know, how good or how bad or how mediocre you play. I think the most important thing is what have you, is there anything you've got to say? With, <laughs> with what Absolutely. You know, does it make sense? Uh, is it, does it hit home? You know, and uh, sometimes you can say a lot with just very few words. And, um, you know, the current trend seems to be to say not so much with a lot of words, you know. Um, I do agree. At the moment, we're in the phase of technical um, exploration of the guitar, you know. So a lot of kids are fascinated by speed and dexterity, speed, dexterity. But um, the uh, the essence of music and the, and the the quality of the tonal quality, the sound, the emotional aspect, and the imagination sometimes is lacking. I find. Also, I agree one hundred percent. You know, there more of that again. Yeah, there are a lot of people out there who have used YouTube so that they could learn, well, for example, sales of Sharon. Or, yeah, um, I don't know or... how many there are. It's amazing, actually. You know, like when I turn on YouTube, of course, they always put, if, if there's a name connection, YouTube knows who I am, you know. So I get tons of, oh, yeah, check out my sales of Sharon, you know. And um, some of them are quite good and some of them are, pretty atrocious you know but i guess there's room for for everything you know well my my thought is okay that's great so you can copy uli or you can copy eddie van halen's eruption but what have you written you know to me yeah. th i agree with what you're saying about um you know going through the process the way that we did and and it uh, enhancing your creative process speaking of creative processes you have a brand new book coming out very soon from what I understand, it will be out sometime during this tour. Um, and it, it, it is um, an, an autobiography, from what I understand. Uh, in, in... Uh, no, it's absolutely the opposite. Okay. It's not autobiography. Um, got it right here. It's this. <laughs> See how big it is. Wow. Quite a, quite a monster and very heavy. It's got uh, about... 600 pages um and i can't really show it like there are some lovely um, illustrations and photos in there yeah, yeah i i did the entire layout of the book myself because i wanted it to be homogenous and artistically pleasing and um there's about at least a thousand photos and illustrations from um, a lot of which i've made myself um and uh, the book is not about myself at all uh i i don't really figure in it much it's about the things that um uh it's basically about my view of uh things that are unspeakable you know like um it's it's a little esoteric it, it talks a lot about uh, the mind, our uh, our inner being, and it also speaks a lot about um, the laws of music, which I find are um, very much the same as the physical laws that govern the universe. And uh, these um, laws of music, I'm most interested in the metaphysical angle, like why are certain notes different from others and why are certain constellations of notes what why do they evoke certain feelings in, in us um and i was fa always fascinated by that uh, uh, because none of it is accidental there's always like a deeper reason and a deeper connection and um as a musician i find it interesting to see the world uh with music lives uh and so I'm presenting kind of a different world view, which 
makes a lot of sense for me because I've uh, had this book worldview since I was uh, in my early 20s and I've um, done an awful lot of thinking and probing in that direction. So the book is kind of the combined essence of, of that. You know, it's got quite a scope. It's uh, it's not just about one thing. It's about many things. Um, but they, these many things are all interconnected. <laughs> and sometimes uh, the connections may be totally obvious. Sometimes they're more, they're further apart, you know. Um, I also am fascinated at looking at opposites, how uh, two opposite forces relate and how, um, although they're opposing, uh, they can be bridged and connected in a, in a meaningful way. And we you should know. let people know the, the book is uh, titled In Search of the Alpha Law. Correct, and yeah. So you've got a hard copy there. Do you have an idea of when it's going to be released now? or uh, It's not going to be long now because we did everything. Um, it uh, should go to print sometime next month. And uh, then they're already uh, on the tour. They're already selling um, uh, vouchers. Okay. You know, and but we have not yet advertised it on the web, or, or it's not yet out there. This will, this will happen soon. You know? uh, and we're not <clears throat> going through a commercial publisher because I deliberately didn't want that really because I didn't want the book commercialized <laughs> because com publisher going to a publisher yes the book make might be a little bit sm smoother if you have like an editor um you know more streamlined more mainstream they take off some of the edges etc but uh I wanted it like to remain untarnished from commercial aspects. You know, it's, this book is not there in order to make money because it's ridiculous the amount of time I spent into it. It is really there because I want it to be there. And ultimately I wrote it for my Sky Academy students because whenever we did Sky Academy in the past, which we started back in 2006 in Los Angeles, um, they always asked, you know, can we read about that stuff somewhere? And I always said, well, no, not really, you know. So, but now <clears throat> I've got that. And that's why we're also starting this uh, Sky Academies again. And um, so it all comes uh, comes full circle, you know. Very nice. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll be looking forward to getting a copy. I'm assuming that they'll be available through your website then? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> it's not only going to be that. Um, there will be multiple channels. I've got some people uh, dealing with all that, distributors, etc. And it shouldn't be too difficult to to actually uh, get it. You know, so we we will see that that process will start very soon. Speaking of uh, Sky, uh, I know that you are accredited as being one of the early innovators in neoclassical uh, music. Um, and <laughs> I, I don't know how means. many people are aware of, of just how multifaceted your playing is. I've seen you playing on uh, a very lovely seven string nylon, uh, Godin guitar. Uh, oh, that's and, a long time ago. Yeah. And you, you have your own, uh, custom built sky guitars. Now, from what I understand, you wanted to have a guitar built with extra frets so you could emulate the violin. Is that correct? Yeah, that was the original intention behind the Sky Guitar. <clears throat> That's why the uh, this guitar came into being, this this kind of guitar, you know? Um, like, even early on in my early 20s, I um, often ran out of frets, quite literally, on a traditional uh, Stratocaster guitar. I wanted to go slightly higher. And I was always listening to these violin concertos, and I said, wow, you know? They can do that, and why does the guitar? Why is the guitar not able to do that? So I came up with a different body shape, which enabled me to play much higher. Then I had a very good guitar builder who built the first Sky guitar, and it worked. That was back in 1983, and I haven't looked back since. You know, since then I've only played Sky guitars. 
and uh, we're selling them on on the market um, as mail order. Um, there's about a two year waiting list. Uh, they're all hand built. Uh, yeah, I'll yeah. bet that's. Uh, I mean, not many artists have their own. Um, special design guitar like there are a lot of guitarists out there top shelf players who have endorsements yeah. with gibson yeah. or fender or whatever and yeah, they'll sure. you know tweak it a little bit but this is something really special yes um it, it is actually uh almost like a new instrument you know like if you have if you look at the violin family of stringed instruments you have the violin you have the viola you have the cello now the difference between these is only the size and they have um, different strings. You know, like the, uh, the viola will have a bass string that the violin doesn't have. But essentially, uh, the fretboard, the fingerboard is uh, very similar, you know. But because of all this, they sound different because, because they have different sizes. Now, this, the sky guitar is quite a different animal from a standard guitar, not just because of the extended top range. Also, my uh, Mighty Wing guitar in the 80s was the first seven string um, in electric um, guitar. And that kind of started a little revolution because that's copied by many people. Um, and uh, so then we started to um experiment with new pickup systems and we developed uh, developed an extremely sophisticated pickup system called mega wing you know and then nowadays the the main sky guitars that i'm playing on stage they're all singing all dancing they've got an armory of special effects from echo to bloopers whatever plus all the other things they are technologically extremely advanced instruments you know and um and that's that but it takes a real player to get something out of them it's a bit like driving a formula one car you know you can't <clears throat> do it so easily or you'll, you'll crash into a wall you, you really need to know what you're doing you know? but some people just buy them because they love the way they look and then they're just hanging on the wall you know there's quite a few actually <laughs> Oh, I was in a local uh, guitar store a, a number of years ago, and uh, the proprietor said to me, you know, you're not one of our best customers. Our best customers are doctors <laughs> and lawyers and dentists, yeah. you know, not the pro. We got a lot of these. You're absolutely right. Lawyers, dentists. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, because they have the money. I mean, guys like you and I, yeah. at least in the beginning, we had to, you know, struggle to to put our pennies together to buy <laughs> our first gibson or fender guitar you know but uh well i had a dad who supported me a lot he bought me these expensive guitars even in the beginning you know um the just before my dad died uh 1972 he bought me this beautiful um segovia concert model ramirez guitar which back then cost as much as his entire paycheck for one month. It was a small fortune. And he was a well-paid journalist even back then. And he did that. I still have that guitar. It's still in prime condition. And I've played it on Flight to Rainbow. I've played it on Under a Dark Sky and um, Symphonic, a prologue to Symphonic Legends. Every once in a while, I'm bringing that guitar. You know? So uh, it's lovely. Lovely to have that. So I was lucky that my dad and my mom, they were supportive of me. He bought me a Stratocaster guitar. I know a lot of people on this bus. We had this discussion yesterday where their dads did exactly the opposite, you know, and they said, no way. And yeah, so I was very, very lucky to have um, supportive parents. Yeah, that that is uh fairly rare in the music business. I mean, I talk to a lot of artists who say, you know, uh, my dad didn't want me to play. My mom would let me sneak out, whatever, but it's very yeah. rare. And it's, it's so nice when you do have that support from within your family. Yeah. Well, I grew up in a very artistic household, you know, my dad drawing, painting, he taught me how to draw, paint, you know, uh, how to write poems, you know, I mean, when I was 16, like my first ever poem ended up as uh, uh, the Flight to Rainbow poem. 
you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was possible because I grew up in a household in a household like this. My brother was the same, you know. And uh, when parents are supportive, that's that is so nice. And parents who are not supportive of their children have a lot to answer for. Um, some people are just so small-minded and, and narrow-sighted that they don't understand that their offspring needs support to unfold. And of course. Um, you know, uh, some people are uh, very, um, <clears throat> they've, they've been beaten down by the system, you know, yes, you need a job, you need to make money, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, which is all very true. And there's hardly any money in music nowadays. Um, but uh, robbing a child of the opportunity to unfold their musicality is almost like a crime, you know. It's like tying somebody's wings and making sure they never fly. Uh, it's horrible, you know. Even if I mean, not many people have it in them to become professional musicians, you know. But you can always have it as a serious hobby, play the piano, and so it. It's so good for your brain, it's so good for your mind and your spirit. You know, music is such a thing that some people just can't see that because they've never had it themselves and then they think yeah why should my child have it? you know it's not good but that's the way the world is well there's a lot to unpack there but you know i think part of it is the evolution of music and and what um i try my best to listen to new music it's not easy because it's not meant for me you know, I think this is what the struggle is a lot of the times with parents and their children. Mm -hmm. You know, this isn't Elvis. What are you listening to? Whatever. That being said, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I also feel like music is the doctor. And no matter what level you get to, um, I mean, I've had young people come up to me when I'm playing a live show and they'll say, wow, I love your playing, you know, and I, I can't play like that or, you know, I'm no good. I just have a good. So I'll say, well, when you play. Do you enjoy it? Do you have fun? Well, yeah. Well, that's all that matters. You know, not everybody can be yeah. Uli John Roth. Not everybody can be Eddie Van Halen, but you can have fun. Yeah, yeah, oh, absolutely. Yes. Um, uh, music can be even more than fun. It can be, um, you say it's the doctor, and it can be, absolutely. You know, I remember when, just before I started the guitar, uh, I had uh, terrible asthma and I nearly died a couple of times from it. Um, as soon as I started the guitar, it went away because I had found my vocation. And before that, I there was something missing and my subconscious knew that, I guess. So that translated into, um, into that... Uh, very uh, serious um, illness, you know. I have not, not ever had it since, but I've had music, you know, and um, I'm well grounded in myself also thanks to music. Yeah. Well, I, I certainly agree with everything you've said there. Um, I'm, I'm curious now with um your mastery of the guitar do you do your own maintenance on your guitars no i'm not good with that at all um i i, I leave that to the uh, guitar builder or um our tech um what i do do is i always keep my guitars in good condition i treat them with the utmost respect always so even my old guitars look relatively new um you know, I'm not one of these people who could ever uh, mistreat a guitar like what Jimmy did or or Pete Townsend. You know, I could not do that. Smash a guitar to me is like the ultimate crime. You know, I mean, I've never smashed anything, so I'm just not that kind of person. You know, but um, smashing an instrument, no, I I can't do it. I I really wouldn't uh, want that because if you smash the instrument it's almost like an attack on music itself and to me music is something sacred it's holy it's like going to church i may sound like some kind of bumbling idiot from the past but this is what it feels like to me and also when i 
take a guitar. Um, it's always special, and it always feels like new. And I don't play that often. I play extremely rarely um, on a tour. You'll never see me sitting with a guitar. You'll only, I'll only take it out before I go on stage. I don't play myself in, just straight in, you know, and that's it, and that keeps it fresh for me, you know, and also a certain danger element, which I like. Um, so it's not, you don't end up being complacent. If I play too much, um, I uh, find I'm losing that mojo, you know, and the mojo is the most important thing. The, uh, the uh, feeling, the sensation that it's alive, it's now, it's fresh, and it happens, you know, even when you're playing stuff that you've played a lot of times, to always put a new spin on it and make it alive. You have to infuse it with spirit, otherwise it's just dead. You know, there are some bands who replicate their own songs, and it sounds literally like the ghosts of something from the past. It's not alive anymore. And then, oh, yes, you're getting yes, see? I and I I've right. seen a lot of really good concerts. The heyday, they were amazing. Yeah. I've seen a lot of really good concerts and of course being a, a musician back in the 70s just starting out all of the older guys said you got to listen to Yes and you got to learn how to play Roundabout mm -hmm. and all of this stuff. When I saw them live, like you say they replicated it 110% accuracy but it was one of the yeah. most boring concerts I've ever seen because yeah. they, yeah. they were on a rotating stage moving very slowly. And even John Anderson was reading lyrics on a big piece of uh, Bristol board, yeah. you know, brilliant musician. When was that? When was that? Um, the 92, 93, the union. All tour. right. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I know what you mean. Um, <clears throat> there is a danger in being overly perfect. And uh, the uh, the spirit of rock is not necessarily in perfection. You know, it's, it, there needs to be a certain uh, freshness, um, a revolutionary danger element almost. And you have that with all the great pieces in rock music. When they came out, they were completely unique and um and one-offs you know uh yes wrote a lot of things i mean uh if you have like for instance uh rick wakeman he still has that mojo he is still he's, he's so genuine as an artist you know he can still be just as exciting as back then you know but not everybody can do that yeah and i i think that for a lot Some of people use it when they get older because they start to almost I want to say the word, but like almost calcify from within. And then they stay in their comfort zone all the time. You know, if you stay constantly in your comfort zone without challenging yourself, then you're not there like you used to be. Like in the beginning, the things that the great things happen when you're going beyond your comfort zone, you know. And so uh, some people write all their best stuff like when they're very uh, young and then afterwards they stay in their comfort zone for the rest of their life and for the rest of their lives and the, the rest is just more of the same, you know. And then the quality goes down. Um, that happens, unfortunately. Yeah. And it's not something, I, I think it's a trap to fall into. You know? Well, I, I agree with the idea of not playing all the time as well. Um, even though I've got my guitars out around me, I, I don't think I've even played, uh, for the last few days. And I find that it, it does present a challenge, uh, when you are on stage, if you haven't played for a little bit, you know, I mean, I'll do my warm ups and so on, but I also find it very inspiring to pick it up after a little bit of time away. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I mean. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we, I know you, you've got Texas and uh, Germany and Ireland. Uh, once this tour is over, what's next for you? Well, uh, I'm spending, we, we have a few festivals in the summer. That's normal. We play the Wacken Festival, uh, some things here and there. But mainly I'll use the summer to be creative at all, which is what I love the most. Got a whole bunch of oil paintings stacked up that I want to do. I want to get back into that, which I used to do. 
Um, also, we're preparing for some orchestra shows for next year, and that's a long-term preparation. Uh, you know, it's an ongoing kind of thing. So uh, I've got my work cut out. You know, and in the in the um, in the fall, in the autumn, we'll uh, do a European tour. Very nice. Well, we'll all be looking forward to everything new coming from uh, Uli John Roth. And uh, uh, once again, the new book, In Search of the Alpha Law, will be out very soon. And uh, I, I, I know you have a lot on your plate and you're a very busy man. Uh, I don't want to take up your whole day, but I do want to thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to do this with me today. And until next time, cheers. Thank you, Tommy. Bye-bye. Tommy Solo's Famous Friends is a one-man production, meaning that I've done all the work, including recording, editing, guest acquisition, etc. And hey, here's some news. We've just recently joined forces with 519 Magazine, so you can check out my interviews there as well. The theme song for Tommy Solo's Famous Friends is a clip from my original composition, The Burn, All Rights Reserved. If you enjoy the show and you'd like to help us keep it going, why don't you click on the Buy Me a Coffee link in the show notes. Hit the like button, subscribe, all that stuff. We really appreciate it. You can find me on Facebook and Instagram. And until next time, cheers.